and then I'm going to do something just so simple, so simple, but it's going to be amazing how it can open your eyes. Uh, and you say, Preacher, why do you do stuff like this, charts and stuff? Because I know this generation is visual learners. This generation was brought up on television, and uh, the older generation was brought up on uh, a radio and books. They have a mind and can see and can picture in their head what you're talking about. But this new generation, the younger kids, they brought up on TV, and without picture, they just don't seem to get it. And I'm one of those. Amen. I have to have a picture. You draw me a picture and it is truly worth a thousand words. Uh, once I see the big picture, then I can grasp what you're trying to tell me. And that's what I'm doing today is I'm giving you the Old Testament, the big picture. The Old Testament, this is the introduction to the Old Testament. I've taught it here before, but I'm going to go through it again and I'm going to... Uh, show you some things that will be a blessing. There's no way I'm going to be able to cover it as detailed as I would like to or even as detailed as some of the charts that I've drawn. But if you'll get this, and just after it's over with, if you want to come up here and take a picture over your phone, then that way you've got it. That, at, at whatever you want to do, draw it, whatever you want to do, okay? All right, Deuteronomy should be there, chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And let's look at uh, one verse. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread, bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Now, if you go to Matthew 4.4, 4, I'm not going to make you turn there, but Matthew 4.4 4, and also in Luke 4.4, 4, Jesus quotes that verse. Jesus, is, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Job esteemed God's word more than his necessary food. Talking about physical food. He, he, that's how important the word of God was to them. Now, I bring that up to point out something that Jesus over in the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Because today, when people read, all they want to read is the New Testament. Well, preacher, we're in the New Testament. We're not under the law anymore. The Old Testament is referred to a lot of times as the law, and the New Testament is referred to as grace. Because Jesus died, we're under grace, we're no longer bound by the law. We're no longer under that law. But know this, there's a lot of wisdom in there you're forsaking if you neglect to read that Old Testament. If you neglect this ringing, boy, I mean, it's like, he's still in control. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, uh, let's keep going because i got a lot of ground to cover. Sometimes people get 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 all out of whack, but there's nothing in that Bible that He does not want us to read. It's there for us. Think about it. 6,000 years and what God wants us to know is in one book. Every word is going to be precious. Every word ought to be treated as valuable and a necessity. We ought not just skip it because it's got a list of genealogy in it. Chronicles, if you know what I'm talking about. And you get into Genesis and you hit some of them Chronicles and you get into some of those lists of names and you're sitting there, peanut butter, we got wheelbarrow, we got so-and-so. I mean, you just, you just, you, you just giving them all kinds of names and just trying to remember who, who you call them the same thing twice. Amen. It's, but anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through it and hopefully give you a picture that you won't forget and it'll be a blessing. But before we get to this chart, I want to do something very simple. Take your Bible and turn to the very beginning where it says table of contents. Where it has the list. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Where it gives you the list of Bible books. And the page number on how to find it. Now some of y'all, that's the first time y'all seen that. Amen. <laughs> I, I, I mean, when I say turn to, if you don't know where it is, there's nothing wrong with looking at that list and finding what page number to turn to. And the reason I say that is because when I, I didn't get saved, I was 22 years old. 
And when I was 22 years old and they said turn to the book of uh, Job, I was still looking for it an hour later. My mind didn't have Job. I didn't even know how to spell Job. I looked at Job, J-O-B. You know, I mean, I was, seriously, I was that ignorant. I was that ignorant of what the Bible had and what I had to say. So, so I'm going to try to help you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an outline. And if you will, I didn't do it in mine. I didn't do it in mine. Uh, but you can in yours if you want to. Mark on that. And, it, and I'm going to give you uh, an outline of the Old Testament that will help you remember something. Uh, I want to give you a basic introduction and make you familiar with the arrangement as well. So in the future, if I ever say turn to the book of Joel, you'll know exactly which section to turn to. You'll know automatically, without even thinking, you know where that's at. Okay? Now here's the outline. The first point is the only hard point, and the only reason it's hard is because I've given you the proper name. Uh, right there, Beside Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books, that is the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. And that is a Greek word that they put on it. And that word simply means five books. Penta is the, it's Greek for five, like a pentagon, a five-sided building. A pentagram is a five-pointed star. Uh, so, Penta, took, took meaning book, five book, five volume book. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So, right beside there, put, just draw a line above Genesis and put Pentateuch. And then, and then under Deuteronomy, draw another line. Those first five books is called the Pentateuch. Now, watch what's in the Pentateuch. Uh, in Genesis, Right beside the word Genesis in your Bible, just I'm looking for one word that'll help you realize what's in each one of those books. So write creation. Right beside Genesis, put creation. In that you have the creation of man, you have the creation of the universe, you have the creation of sin. Everything was created there. Not only that, but you have the fall of man. You have the fall of man, his subsequent sin, and, and, and goes on into the flood, the destruction of man. You have the spread of man across the globe. All that is in Genesis. You have the creation. Then in Exodus, put calling out. At the end of Genesis, God has called Abraham in the book of Genesis and he deals with that family through most of the book of Genesis 70 go into Egypt and they wind up in bondage in servitude in slavery down there in Egypt and God calls them out in the book of Exodus that's where you get the Pharaoh's story where Moses comes in before Pharaoh and says let my people go and that's the Exodus Exodus think about it Exodus where we get our word exit from. They're to leave Egypt. Amen? So Exodus. So that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on there. Then in Leviticus, you have the commands. Now many people think that uh, Exodus is the book with the commands because in Exodus chapter 20, uh, Moses goes up into Mount Sinai there for 40 days and gets the Ten Commandments. But the and he does. He gets the Ten Commandments. But that's only ten. You get in the book of Leviticus, you get the ceremonial law, you get the uh, uh, dietary law, you get the moral law, you get everything imaginable, even to how they are to dress, cut their hair, everything. It is the book of commands. What days they are to worship on, what days they are to celebrate, what days they are to rest, that is the book of Leviticus. Then in Numbers, you see they are counted. They begin to count the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. Because if you remember, in Genesis, God calls out Abraham. In Genesis 12, and promises him some land. He says he's going to give us some land. And that's what's going on over there in the Middle East right now. That, that going on in the Middle East is nothing more than a family feud. That fighting over Israel, 
God gave that to Abraham. And Abraham, he said, is to pass it on to Isaac, his promised son. There's a bunch of Ishmaelites over there, wanting it, those Arabs. They're, from, they're descendants of his illegitimate child that God rejected. He said, he said it's not going to be Ishmael, it's going to be Isaac. But anyway, let me get going here. I'm going to run out of time. I wanna, don't want to get bogged down in too much. Uh, but in Numbers, they start counting. And you start seeing the size of this nation of Israel. He starts numbering the, the tribes there. Then in Deuteronomy, beside Deuteronomy, write the word charge. Moses sinned, and he smote the rock twice. And God said, because you smoked the rock twice, you're not going to get to go into the promised land. And Moses dies without getting to enter in and see the promised land. But before he dies... He, he preaches one more sermon to the children of Israel. That's the book of Deuteronomy. He charges them before they enter in. Because right after that, look at, look at your context there, your contents, and see what it says. It says Joshua, don't it? Joshua is the one who gets to lead them in. Now we are entering the second section. This section has 12 books. First five is Moses. Then the next twelve. Now you'll remember this. You think you won't, but you'll remember this. The next twelve books are Israel's history. How many tribes are there? Twelve. How many historical books? Twelve. You think you wouldn't remember that, but that statement will stick. That'll make that stick in your head now because you'll think, well, there's 12 tribes, so there's 12 historical books that tell us of, of their history. And, and Now, number two, in your little outline, first you had the Pentateuch. This time, number two, put the past. The past. And we're going to deal with each of these books just real quickly. I'll give you an outline. Uh of them the same as I did. Under Joshua, put the word conquering. Conquering. Why? Because Joshua led them into the promised land and they were squatters in the land. Much like still going on today over there. They got squatters in the land. And when they try to expel them, the rest of the world pitches a fit and, and tries to tell them, no, give them land for peace and it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. God gave it to the, to the Jew. It's theirs. But anyway, Joshua goes in and conquers the giants and all those that were there in the land. But Joshua didn't do it completely. Some of them still survive. Some of them still live. Some of them didn't get utterly destroyed like they were supposed to. And that brings us to the book of Judges. Beside Judges put the word carnality. They have now entered into the promised land. They have fought the wars. They have got the, the blessing that God gave them. They're in the land flowing with milk and honey. Amen. And now what do they do? They sit back. They relax. And they begin to compromise. And they become carnal. That's worldly. If you don't understand the carnal, uh, we get our word carnivore uh, from that word. It means fleshly, carnivorous. Uh, when you go to the carnival, it's a fleshly show. It's to entertain the flesh. Someone who's carnivorous or eats a lot of meat, they, they call them carnivorous. Okay, So carnivore. So, so when I said uh, uh, put carnality, I'm talking about they became fleshly. They live for themselves. In fact, twice in the book of Judges, you know what it says? Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They didn't listen to God. They did that which was right in their own eyes. That was their problem. They, they, they turned from God. And that's, that's the pattern you're going to notice. When we're in trouble, we're in bondage, we, we need help. Lord, get us out of this Egypt. Get us out from under this Pharaoh. Get us out of this trouble. We'll cry out to God, but as soon as God delivers us and we start enjoying the blessed life, we forget about God. 
and we go back into sin or we go back into something like that and eventually we're going to wind up in trouble again and what will we do? Oh God, get us out of this. That's, that's the cycle. It repeats itself over and over throughout history and throughout your life if you don't click, if it don't click. All right? So carnality. Uh, then, now this is what's funny. The next book is Ruth. Right beside Ruth, right choice. Choice. Why? Why? Because Judges and Ruth are taking place at the same time. Even though everybody's gone carnal, even though most of the world's doing that which is right in their own eyes, you have this Gentile woman named Ruth who does right. She still has a choice. Individually, we still have a choice. If the whole world goes crazy, individually, you still have a choice to serve God or not. Amen. And, that, and, and she's a picture of that. She chooses right. When Naomi's going back to uh, Bethlehem, Judah, because she heard that God had visited his people and given them bread, she said to her, uh, she said to her, now remember, Orpah went back, but, but, but Ruth said to Naomi, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. She forsook her God, she forsook her family, she forsook her land, her heritage, and she followed Naomi back to Bethlehem, Judah, and there uh, found her husband. And what a picture, what a picture of, of, of the bride of Christ. But anyway, we'll keep going. Uh, next is 1 and 2 Samuel. Now, here's something interesting in 1 and 2 Samuel. In 1 and 2 Samuel, right after the time of the judges, what happens? Israel gets to looking around in all the Gentile kingdoms and they have kings. But we've got priests, or not priests, I shouldn't say priests. Good night, no, don't say priests. They had prophets that God dealt with, dealt with them through. God would deal with them through prophets. It was a theocracy. Israel was a theocracy. God ruled the people through the priesthood, okay? And the people looked around and said, we don't like that. We want a king. Give us a king so we can be like everybody else. And it broke Samuel's heart. But God said, don't worry. They haven't rejected thee. They've rejected me. So give them a king and tell them what he's going to do. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your lands. He's going to take your children. He's going to bring war. That's what he's going to do. And that's exactly what happened. See, when God was in control, God gave them peace. And God had peace after they got into that land. As long as they'd followed the Lord, the Lord protected them. But he says, you want a king? You can have a king. Important lesson. God lets you have what you want. Better be careful what you want. You might just get it. Amen. You just might get it. But see, you have to pay for the consequences of it. So that's exactly what happened. He gave him Saul. Saul was a terrible king. And then Saul was replaced by David. David was a good king. But David had his problems too. Amen. And then you go on to Solomon. Amen. And, and, and we'll, we'll get into the chart in just a little bit. But here, what we have, write the word character beside that. Character. Because there, their character's beginning to show. Their character's beginning to show. And because they rejected God, poor character, and wanted to, to be like everybody else, there's some consequences. There's some consequences. What's the consequences? In First and Second Kings, write the word captivity. Captivity. Uh, God allows them to go into captivity. They're, they're always warring and fighting. There's always trouble when, when a nation rejects God, when a nation rejects His authority, when a nation rejects His word, when a nation will not respond to Him, He will let their enemies come in and take them over. Over and over and over we see that in the Old Testament. That ought to scare the far out of you. Because what has America done? 
the exact same thing. We've kicked him out of our school. We don't want him in our anthem. We don't want him anywhere but in here. You can't preach in the streets much without getting in trouble. In Canada, they're, they're already arresting people that preach. You let this gay pride filth come in marching and you let a bunch of street preachers go out there, they can be committing lewd acts in the street in front of your children. But me stand there with the Bible and hold it up and just say, thus saith the Lord and start preaching, they'll arrest me and let them do their thing. We've rejected God. We've rejected God. And what's going to happen? Certitude. It may not be in our lifetime, I hope it's not, or in our children or grandchildren's lifetime. But it's coming. It's coming. Now, I give you interesting. Now, this is this is for the adults here. This shouldn't even I shouldn't even say this, but I give you interesting study. Who owns our national parks? Who owns them? They've got signs at the park and they let you know who owns them. America, in 1913, when we left the gold standard, when we, did, we no longer back our money with gold and silver, now we, now we got a note of promise. This is a promissory note. It's paper. We promise to pay. What good is that? If there's no gold or silver to back it up anymore. The only thing we got left now is land and people. That's all America has left. And we're losing land left and right. Do you, that, that's interesting. But anyway, let's keep going. Uh, he, now, now, I'll give you the picture so you'll see it. Joshua, they conquered. America, when we came over here, God blessed us. We was a land flow of milk and honey. What happened? I, over the years, we became carnal, worldly, fleshly. What's all this filth and sin going on today? It's all about the flesh. It's all about let them do what they want to as long as they ain't hurting nobody else. That's what they're talking about is carnality. Even though we're in that mess, you still have a choice like Ruth. Do you have the? And because most have not the character, they're going to be led into captivity. Captive by that sin. Captive by the... Uh, uh, trends of the day. But anyway, let's keep going. First and second Chronicles. Oh Lord, I gotta hurt. <laughs> First and second Chronicles. First and second Chronicles. What is that? It's it's taking you through the kings again and just telling you what it is. Right beside Chronicles, Chronicles, because that's what it is. It chronicles the life of the kings. It tells the acts of the kings. Uh, I'll get to the chart a little while. I'm, I'm, I'm trying fighting to stay away from it. It'd make it easier, but let's keep going. Uh, where are we at? Ezra. Here we go. Ezra. After they are taken into captivity for 70 years, you have what is called post-captivity, or they call it post-azilic. Post-azilic. They try to make it, why didn't you just say post-captivity? But, but after they've been carried away for 70 years, you have these books. Ezra, write the word confession. They confessed that they were wrong, they were sin. And Nehemiah put construction. They began to rebuild the walls and, 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 and get everything going again. Uh, then, and then write the word conspiracy beside Esther. You like a good suspense movie? Man, there ain't nothing better than Esther. Amen. You got a villain who's scheming. And then you've got, uh, a, I mean, it, it, it's good stuff when you get a hold of it. I mean, people like watching this stuff, but Hollywood steals from the Bible all the time. I've showed you that over and over. Uh, but anyway, there's 12 historical books, God dealing with his people, the 12, the 12 Jews. Now, number three in your outline is going to be the next, watch it, five books. Five books. That those next five books are what is known as your poetical books. So number three, put poetical. Poetical. And, and here they are. It's Job through Song of Solomon. Now watch this. Job is a book of suffering. You going through heartaches, troubles, and trials? Read the book of Job. It'll give you comfort like you've never known. Ain't it amazing when we are going through something? We, we, oh, we're down in the mouth. Oh, woozy me. This is terrible. This is awful. God don't love me. Nobody cares for me. And then you look over and somebody's going through worse than you are. 
And they're still going to church. They're still doing right. They still praise the Lord. They still love the Lord. They're still going to work. They're still taking care of their family. They're still getting up and moving on. And you don't even want to get out of bed. Sometimes when you look at someone who had it worse than you and still do it, it makes you feel bad. And sometimes that's what you need to get you going again. Amen. Seeing someone else went through worse and makes it. Amen. So there's the book of suffering. Then you have Psalms. Now, Psalms, write the word songs, S-O-N-G-S, songs. I know I speak with a terrible southern accent, can't get rid of it. Wouldn't, wouldn't want to get rid of it, like it now, amen. Don't care if you don't. <laughs> but anyway, songs. Song, uh, uh, psalms is a beloved book by many. Many love the, the book of Psalms. Why? Because every human emotion is dealt with. David is singing God's praises, jumping on the mountaintop, victory in his life, happy as can be in one psalm. And in the next psalm, he's talking about laying on his pillow and weeping in his tears, wetting his pillow. Weeping through the night in pain and heartache. From the mountaintop to the valley, every emotion you can, I mean, love, whatever, everything is in the book of Psalms. Many love it because of that. Then in Proverbs, you have the sayings. Sayings. Uh, they're just, look, the, the Proverbs are instant wisdom. You want some wisdom? I'll tell you where to get it, kids. Read a, read a proverb or two a day. Every day of your life, just read a proverb, proverb or two a day and just try to get it in your heart. Instant wisdom. I mean, the wisest man that ever lives jotted this down, pinned it down. God put it in His Word. Why would we not take it? Instant wisdom, free, there for the taking. Then you have Ecclesiastes. If ever a book was written for America today, it's the book of Ecclesiastes. If ever a book in the Old Testament was aimed at us today, it would be Ecclesiastes. Why? Selfishness. He said, I gave my heart to know everything. I withheld nothing from it. If he gave his heart to wine, to women, to work, to everything his heart desired, he gave himself. And listen, he wasn't having to steal for it. He wasn't having to steal from mom and dad. He wasn't having to steal from the neighbors. He wasn't breaking in somebody's houses or cars trying to get the stuff. God had blessed him. He had enough money. He could get anything he wanted. And he gave his heart to everything. You know what his conclusion was? Fear God and keep His commandments. This is a whole duty of man because everything down here is vanity. It's void. It's empty. It will not satisfy. Drugs will just make you want more drugs. Alcohol will just make you want more alcohol. Uh, women just make you want more women. Men will just make you want more men. You're never satisfied. Only God can satisfy you. So fear God and keep His commandments. That was his conclusion. All right. Then you have Song of Solomon. Woo, we've been dealing with that some on Sunday nights. We're dealing with couples. There's your love story right there, Song of Solomon. He kisses me with the kisses of his mouth. That's showing how close an intimate relationship and fellowship you could have with the Lord because we are the bride of Christ. And that's what that's a picture of. Now we're moving on uh, to the prophets. Uh, I'm running out of time quickly, so I might have to speed up just a little bit here. Uh, number four in your outlines, the prophets. And guess what? The prophets are, are going to take you from Isaiah all the way through Malachi. But watch, they break up into two sections. They have what is called the major prophets and the minor prophets. And watch the breakdown. Five in twelve. There's five major prophets. And, and they are right there, Isaiah through Daniel. And then there are 12 minor prophets. That's Hosea through Malachi. Now, if you'll look at that, uh, now I will tell you the difference between a major and a minor prophet. A major prophet is called a major prophet not because of the content is more important, but because of the size of the book. Look how big the book of Isaiah is. 66 chapters, that's a pretty big book. And then you get into Obadiah, one chapter. 
That's why it's called a major and minor prophets. Not because of the content, but because of the size of the books, why they're called that. Uh, they should really not call them that, but that's what they're known by. Now, do you know what I've just give you? I've given you an outline, basically, of the entire Old Testament. I'm going to run you through again with this chart and show you something that hopefully will help you. But here's something to think about. Now, if you've listened and you thought about what I've said, I could say to you, turn to the book of Joel, and you would automatically know it's right before the Old, right before the Old Testament closes in the Minor Prophets. If I said turn to uh, Daniel, well, wait a minute, Daniel's one of the major prophets. Well, so that, 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 that's a little bit before the Minor Prophets. So you start figuring out where you should turn, okay? Nehemiah, boy, that used to get people. Esther, Esther. That used to get people because they didn't know where they were in the book. Now you know where they're placed. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the big picture. Genesis, you have Abraham. Now, now watch. In Genesis, you have the creation of everything, the fall of man, and man being uh, covered by, the, by God and, and, and his death, everything is in the first 12 chapters. Actually, the first three for the fall of man. But after that, it goes on and the man populating and told, commanded to go out and, and populate the world and stuff. That takes place in 12 chapters. Then you have this man called Abraham. God calls him out of the Ur of the Chaldees and says, get thee up and, and get away from thy kindred and go to the land that I shall tell thee of. And he goes on and says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curses thee. That's why you better side with the Jew because God promised that to them. That's still binding today, by the way. He'll bless them that blesses them and he'll curse them that curses them. Now that's Abraham. The rest of the book, Genesis has 50 chapters. Only three are on the creation and fall of man. And then the rest of the book basically is taken up with God dealing with a man and his family. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. There's your patriarchs. When you hear somebody say the patriarchs, that's who they're talking about. Abraham and his children. All right? After that, Joseph, we know Joseph saves the world. By being able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, there's a famine coming. You remember the famine coming? And then Joseph had, had uh, his dad bring all the children into Egypt. That's how Israel ended up in Egypt. There were 70 of them that went in there. When they came out, they were estimated nearly 2 million, around 2 million. 430 years down there in bondage. Uh, don't know exactly how long they were down there. Total, me and Bradley told about that before the service. Don't know exactly how long they was down there. But there was 430 years of bondage down there. And then they come out strong. They go through Joshua who leads them into the promised land. Then you go uh, to Judges where they compromised and got carnal. And Ruth, who made the right choice. And Samuel, where they said, we want to be like everybody else. Give us a king. So God gave them Saul, David, Solomon. Now here's where you got to pay attention. Solomon sinned. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. God, God appeared to Solomon when he was going to make him king. said, ask of me anything you want. I mean, like a genie in the bottle, basically. He could add any wish he wanted. One. And he said, grant me wisdom that I might be able to rule, judge thy people. And it so pleased God that he gave him wisdom and said that there's been none like him since. He was the wisest man to ever live. And he also gave him riches and popularity. Bill Gates, his outhouse wouldn't come close to what Solomon had. I mean, Solomon's outhouse was better than what Bill Gates had got. That's why I should have said that. I mean, he had everything. Now, but here was his problem. The kings were not to multiply silver. He multiplied it like it was dust in the street. 
kings wasn't to multiply horses. He had chariot cities. He had cities that was built just to take care of his horses and chariots. He had so many. He wasn't to multiply wives. He had 700 of them. And 300 concubines on the side. He had sin. In fact, his sin and multiplying wives led him to allowing them. I mean, could you imagine that being 700 anniversaries, remember? <laughs> Seven, something good night. If you show a little more favor to one, why are you, why are you so good to her kids and not our kids? Could you imagine the mess that would have been? That's the wisest dummy ever lived. <laughs> but seriously, he, he catered to his wives and he allowed them to build groves and it caused Israel to turn from God and they began to worship other gods. And God said, because you've done this, the kingdom will not stand like it is. While Solomon was king, there was peace. God blessed him so much, there was peace all around Israel. There wasn't no fussing, no fighting, no feuding, no nothing during that time. Perfect picture of the millennium when the Lord comes. But God said, because you've sinned and allowed that, I've blessed you, so I'm not going to do it in your lifetime. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide the kingdom and your kids will pay for it. Your kids will pay the price. Boy, what a lesson, Mom and Dad. So when Solomon died in 926 B.C., God split the kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom, Israel, and then the southern kingdom, Judah. These are ten tribes and two tribes. You ever heard of the ten lost tribes? They ain't lost. God knows exactly where they were. Uh, that's coming up in a second. But anyway, that's why when you're reading, it talks about King Jeroboam and King Rehoboam. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought Jeroboam was king. And then I'd be reading and they talking about uh, Rehoboam, and I, I get so confused. I don't know why it took me forever, but it finally clicked that the kingdom had split. And it was going simultaneously. So you had to tell which one. Now, Israel, the ten northern tribes, had, I believe it was 19 kings that they had. Let me see. Yeah, they had 19 kings total. And all of them, all of them was wicked. All of them turned Israel away from God. All of them did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. All of them was wrong. So in 722 B.C., God allowed the Syrians to come in and conquer them. Led them captive. Now, Judah had 20 kings. Now, there's different time periods. They, they made it a lot longer than their, than their brothers up here in the north. They mean the southern... <laughs> they stuck it out a little longer, amen. But anyway, they hung in there a little longer. Why? Because they had eight good kings. So when you're reading your Bible, if you'll draw this out, when you're reading your Bible and you see a king, jot him down. Start jotting him down in which, which kingdom he was a king to, and you'll start being able to divide your Bible up and start getting a better picture of what's going on. Understand? So they had 20 kings. They lasted longer, but in 606, they too fell to, they, they fell to Babylon. Now, I left one out there. I just now noticed that. Yeah, 612. Uh, here's another date you might want. Uh, 612. In 612, of course, that's B.C., Assyria conquered the north. Babylon conquered Assyria. And that took the northern tribes in as well and assimilated them into Babylon. Then in 606, Babylon conquered the southern. They are carried away 70 years. During that 70 years, you, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second, but during that 70 years, their, their servitude, from that point on, they lost their sovereignty as a nation. They no longer are a nation. They are no, they, 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 after the captivity, Cyrus, wait a minute, Assyria, Babylon, Babylon. Babylon's got control of the whole world right there, basically. They are conquered. 
by the media Persian Empire. That's in 38, 39 BC. Cyrus the king's a good king and he allows them to go back and rebuild their land. But they are not a sovereign nation. They are a nation under control of the Medes and the Persians. They are allowed. Remember, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king and it wasn't a Jewish king. See, they were servants to another nation. They don't become a sovereign nation again all the way until over here in 1948. That's interesting when you get a hold of it. Now, if you want a better picture of what's actually going on, uh, this is how the Old Testament ends. Now, 1st and 2nd Kings takes you through and tells you the story again. 1st and 2nd Chronicles takes you through and tells you the Chronicles of the Kings again. Then, what about Isaiah through Malachi? What about them? Now, get this. They are telling the same story, but it's not a history story. They're telling the same story and what God was saying during that time. So when you get into that, somebody turn to the book of uh, Hosea. Somebody, Hosea chapter 1 verse 1 and read that to me. Read it out loud. You got it? The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Jerusalem, in the days of Hosea. Okay, that's good. In the days of Hosea. Okay. Did you see, just told you who the king was. In the days of. See, they tell you who the servant is. So when you write the kings down, when you're reading them, start matching the prophet that went with them. And what you're getting is what God was saying to Israel during that time. What God was telling them, how God was trying to warn them, how God was trying to help them. That's what you're getting there. So that's the Old Testament. Now, at the end of the Old Testament, there's 400 years of silence where God says nothing. Just 400 years of silence. And then Jesus shows up and Rome's in control. Israel's under the control of Rome. How is that? Well, the book of Daniel tells us how. Uh, the book of Daniel, if you remember, how many of you remember the image Nebuchadnezzar built? The image in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, I think it is, is the way that worked out. He built, he, he built an image. And the head, the head was Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. His shoulders and arms, I'm just going to make it look like he's crossed his arms here. His shoulders and his arms was the Media Persia Empire. They were conquered by Alexander the Great. That was the belly. You remember? And then Rome came in and there's the legs. You have the uh, Eastern and Western Orthodox. Rome was in control. So when the New Testament opens, Rome's in control. That's why. So when the Old Testament closes, you, you're still dealing with the Medes. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, where did the Romans come from? Well, reading the book of Daniel tells you what happened during that time. Okay? And in fact, it goes in and deals with the tribulation and the Antichrist and the ten toes. Uh, the Antichrist over his kingdom will be during that time. All that's in the book of Daniel. See, we're told everything and how it's going to lay out. People talk about well, the Lord coming, the Lord coming, and they want to read the New Testament verse. I'm going to tell you something. There's more on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ than those books than anywhere else. There's more about his second coming in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament. Why? Because the, God's people was looking for him to come and set up his kingdom. And they kept telling him he's coming, but he kept, he, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And they won't listen. They wouldn't listen. Amen. But anyway, any questions on that? I know that's a lot of material. I couldn't even do it half the justice that I wanted to. But I hope it opened maybe your eyes and helped somebody with your Old Testament. How many of you want the New Testament next week? All right, we'll do the New Testament like that next week. I'll, I'll draw it out and show you how it lays out. Amen. All right, any questions? Yes, sir. 
the dark ages <clears throat> yet with the dark ages what we call the dark ages was actually in the church age uh, what we call the dark ages it was because of the persecution that came on the early church and stuff uh, and, and a lot of the dark ages were brought on by the Roman Catholic the Roman Catholic Church, they were persecuting Bible believers. They persecuted uh, Bible believers as heretics because they didn't believe in their hierarchy. And, you know, they didn't, you know, you remember Rome, they used to sell, what did they call that? I forget what it was, but they'd go around and sell uh, like finger bones of John the Baptist. You know, I think they sold like 142 finger bones or something like that. They found that they actually sold his. They had two skulls. One was big and one was little. And they said, what's that about? And they said, well, this one's when he was young, the small one, you know. <laughs> I, I, indulgences, that's what it was. They would sell indulgences and stuff, and they would sell their prayers and stuff. It was just a bunch of con artist stuff. But anyway, that was the dark ages, when the Bible was burning, when they tried to hide it from the common people. You don't have to go through a priest to get to God. You can bow your head and go to him just as good as I can or anybody else. And anybody tries to tell you you've got to come to them or come to their church, run from their attitude. They're, they're crazy. Amen. All right. That get it? Anybody else? Yes, sir. That's the best thing you ever heard. All right. I'll, I'll take that. That's the call me out of mouth of babes. Amen. All right. Father, Lord, do thank you and pray, Lord, you just bless. In Jesus' name, amen.